Oh, anyway, so it looks like um, Vince is not yet in the room, but um, anyway, I just want to re-remind everybody that if you do want to join the lecture live, um, here's the uh, Blackboard Collaborate link. It's right, it's, uh, right in the middle of the, the course website. right up here. Next time you can't make it to lecture, you can just click right there and we'll go. All right, so I want to pick it back up with the textbook, Courses, NRGY 101, and we're going to start it on section 9.4. This is electric traction, and the first figure there is uh, figure 20 and 21 from the textbook. So we've already covered uh, fossil fuels in this course. We've talked about a lot about how petroleum allows us to drive our motor vehicles. Uh, here's a couple shots of how you can use electricity also to move a, um, some kind of passenger vehicle. So the one, the first one here is Volks Railway in Brighton prototype electric horse tram system for 1883, still running, amazing, 2002. Uh, figure 1921, a new tram in court, and also in 22, the tram tracks have been lifted in 1928 and then, and then were replaced. And so electromotive power, in this case you're going to have some kind of, I think I can sort of see it right here, a third rail where the electricity is actually coming in. So the electricity obviously drives a motor, the motor creates torque, uh, the torque is transferred in terms of force to the rails, and the car goes forward. In this case, the electricity is overhead, so you've got uh, plus and minus, your, your, your two um, wires overhead, and the tram is connected there through an electrode, and again, it's got a motor that provides traction force with the ground. I also want to read this little box uh, 9.6, um, and I'm, I'm just going to read straight from it. It says, given the modern search for alternative biofuels for road transport, I guess you could think of a horse as being a biofuel-powered uh, vehicle, one might ask why bus and tram companies abandoned motive power that ran on hay and oats in favor of very expense, expensive electric traction. Well. The first problem was a horse shortage. New railways encouraged the movement of goods and people, but once they arrived in cities, their finally delivery involved horse transport. So you might have a, you know, a bigger thing coming in and the horse would sort of infiltrate to the individual vendors. The man is such that in 1873, a House of Commons select committee inquiry was set up to see whether the country could actually breed enough horses to keep the cities running. The second was logistics of, of operation. A tram or a bus normally used two horses. There had to be plenty of spares. So a, a spare horse sitting around would be used to get it up the hills. They were changed four or five times a day, and they were given one day's rest for every four. By 1898, London's remaining horse trams line still required 14,000 horses to run their 1,451 trams, or about 10 per tram. Uh, the third problem is that urban streets were covered with horse, horse droppings. A horse could produce five tons of excrement and urine per year, a major health hazard, requiring a whole army of crossing sweepers to keep the pedestrian crossings clear. Um, electric tram, so again, you can think of the horse as a technology that, you know, had its problems. Uh, the electric tram might require complicated wiring with a risk of electrocution, but it was easy to drive, clean, odorless, and only required parking space for itself. Uh, the not-so-clean electricity generation plant, if actually owned by the tram company, could be placed conveniently out of the end of the line, similar to where we put our coal-fired power plants way out in the middle of nowhere. At the stable, sold off to the property developer. No modern city of the 1890s could afford to be without an electric tram system. So, technology evolution. Okay, and here's a much more... Uh, modern version, the Eurostar power car. There's um, a couple things in the um, in the book talking about running at 300 kilometers per hour, uh, running at 12 megawatts of electricity, and needing 25 kilovolts of AC. It says right now only about 40% of the UK's main line is electrified, 
and further electrification would become one way of mitigating the risks of peak oil. So that the question then becomes, where does the electricity come from? Well, if you're running on renewables, wind, solar, et cetera, then you could, in fact, get all the way off the carbon, uh, carbon grid. Okay, now there's a little thing on battery electric vehicles. Couple shots of those. We're looking at 1899 record-breaking battery electric car, the Jame Content Never Content car. Always need to go faster. And then um, figure uh, 924 battery electric roadster. Uh, there's a couple of these in town. In fact, um, Glenn Kreisel has, has brought his Tesla by, and it, it is one impressive machine. Regenerative braking is mentioned here. One, another thing that Glenn said in, in driving his car is he, he almost never touches the brakes. So the car, as, it's, uh, as soon as you take your foot off the accelerator, so when, once your foot's off the accelerator, what it does is um, really more or less immediately starts, uh, starts braking. I'm going to see if I can't get my face back up here again so I can make some finger puppets. I'm going to talk with my hands. So at, as I was mentioning in the, in, the, in the Tesla, as soon as you take your foot off the accelerator, the regen braking automatically kicks in. It just assumes, okay, so you don't want to go fast anymore. You're approaching a, an obstacle intersection, I'm, and it's automatically going to start putting that um, uh, kinetic energy of the vehicle back into the brakes. Now, uh, I'm yet to see a vehicle that has eliminated mechanical brakes entirely, uh, simply because that you know that, that friction, you know, metal on metal or, or um, you know two two materials touching each other is always going to provide a quicker, faster, and a more effective uh, force than just the the back EMF in in the, in the brakes. So, but. You know, or if you've driven the um, driven the Priuses, you'll notice there's not only a, a D uh, gear to be in, but also a B, and that'll essentially do the same thing. So anytime you're taking your foot off the accelerator, it'll, it'll automatically and sort of aggressively go into braking mode. So you're not seeing the tail lights all the time. All right, and so obviously, if you have an electric car, you need rechargeable batteries. That's these are outlined on box. Uh, 9.7, so lead-acid batteries invented in 1859, we still use them today, um, says the principal problems are the limited life. You can also look at energy densities, this is something I encourage you to take a look at, this comes into a lot of engineering calculations. This is one of my favorite figures. Gosh, I, I thought that the lead acid battery was on this chart. Maybe it's <laughs> maybe it's too small. It's probably up in the list, but you can see that um, on a on a per mass basis, well, the, the lithium ion batteries are actually pretty low, and and on a per volume basis, let's go back. I'm, I'm betting the uh, the lead acid batteries here. Okay, here we go. Um, lead acid batteries, 2.6 megajoules. Um, in, a, in a single battery, 0.17 megajoules per kilogram. Not as energy dense as a ham and cheese sandwich. So make, make a car that can burn that, you're going to do better. Um, also not quite as good as a double-A battery, you might say, well, gosh, that's terrible. Why don't we just put a whole bunch of double-A batteries in our car? Well, not as cost-effective. Um, but here's the, here's the kicker. You can see that the lithium-ion battery, and that's the style that are typically used in these Teslas, have a much better energy density, so the car can be lighter and, and faster. So that's really the critical factor in those guys. Um, Nickel-iron, 
batteries are mentioned, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, uh, and so a lot of different metals going into these, uh, going into these various batteries. Okay, now I'm just going to flip over and take a look at table 9.2. And what's mentioned here are critical rare elements. So we've got, and I'll pull up the periodic table so we know what we're looking at here. This is figure 9, or table 9.2. I'm just going to read through them. So we're looking at... Um, we're looking at cerium, CE, let's find that really quick, CE, there it is, element 58 is cerium, um, lanthanum, just to the left, element 57, lithium, way up at the top, that's number three, Europium, number 63. Indium, that's up here at 49. Uh, terbium, this is 65. Yttrium, uh, there's your vitrium. Where did yttrium go? Oh, is, uh, is 39. There's yttrium. Uh, Dipsporium, and those, the ones that I just mentioned were in, in batteries and lighting. Uh, the magnetic materials that are mentioned are uh, dis, dysprosium, neodymium, and samarium. And if you, um, if you ever watched, what was it, um, uh, House of Cards, that, that show with Kevin Spacey, they, 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 talk, they talk a lot about samarium. And also what you'll notice is that a lot of these metals are mined in China. So, and anytime you've got large volumes of valuable metals, typically the government invo gets involved and um, trade agreements and, and money, et cetera, and it, be, it can become kind of a uh, political issue in addition to an ec economic one. Uh, but samarium, anyway, using cobalt to make strong permanent magnets for motors and generators. And these things are not being you know, dug up out of, in just pure form. Uh, they're, they're rare and typically found together and then have to be um, processed and typically put inside a magnetic field to increase their strength. And then you can start to get into the argument about, okay, what are the environmental effects of mining these things, et cetera, et cetera. Is it any better or any worse than mining coal and oil, et cetera, and, you know, kind of added ad infinitum. But there they are. Okay. So here's a Prius. You can see the, the high-voltage battery. You can see the motor and generator. So there are, in fact, two um, propulsive devices. One's, one's the engine. The one uh, burning gasoline, and then the uh, the motor and, and generator. So in the case, you know, the motor obviously is driving the wheels, and it can also be run more or less in reverse as a as a regen for braking, and then recharging the batteries. And if you ever if you've ever been in one, there uh, it's pretty impressive because, because it kind of shows you the flow of energy as it's as it's going through the system, and it gives you kind of real time feedback on your driving habits. Uh, serial versus hybrid, or sorry, serial versus parallel drive systems in a series system. Everything uh, actually runs through the electric motor, so the uh, engine would charge the batteries and the batteries would drive the motor. If you have a parallel system, both the engine and the motor are connected to the wheels and they can, they can run in parallel. In, in general, the parallel system is going to be more efficient because you don't have the losses of running the engine to charge the batteries, etc. cetera. Um, but they each offer their engineering challenges. Right. Now, that was 9.4, attractive power. Now we're looking at 9.5, and I'm on page 342, expanding uses. So this is figure 926. This is growth in world electricity demand. Um, now it mentions that this is this is a 
a logarithmic scale. So if you remember back to what we've been doing with our summary three, we've been using an exponential scale. And a logarithmic scale is just the same as um, same as an exponential, just just different, just the opposite. <laughs> and I'll explain basically what those are here. Um, <coughs> The neat thing about both an exponential and a logarithmic scale is that neither one really ever die. The exponential scale will always be above zero no matter how far negative you make it, and then we'll sort of head up and get uh, and increase uh, faster and faster the higher it gets. The logarithmic scale is also asymptotic, meaning that it never really touches this vertical axis and kind of heads off uh, in this direction. It'll get to infinity eventually, but at an ever diminishing rate. So in this case, you can see it sort of goes off gangbusters. And this is more or less sort of, you know, meeting the demand. So all of a sudden, you know, a few very wealthy people have it. And a bunch of other, they'd be like, gosh, I'd really love to, you know, read my books at night and not set my curtains on fire with my candles and kill the last whale, et cetera. Yeah, let's all get electricity. So there's your 30% per year. And then, you know, eventually everyone has it. Um, and the demand tapers off. Um, there are other reasons for the demand tapering off. And, and one of them is sitting right here with our LED problem. You know, you can, you can get as much Efficacy, which is what we talked about last time. Efficacy meaning you know, how many lumens per watt are you going to get out of this thing. So as the efficacies and the efficiencies, so I can write that as you know efficacy being eta and efficiency being uh, oh sorry uh, e efficiency being epsilon or gosh efficacy being epsilon efficiency being eta that is going to lead to lower demand uh, and, you know, kind of over here we can just sort of say, um, you know, early adopters um, and early demand, sort of driving that, that curve. Um, you know, will this thing ever die? Probably not. I, I think electricity demand will, will always continue to increase. In fact, there's an, been a lot of articles lately on um, India really trying to, to bring up its standard of living and it's remarkable. They have something like 400 million people still living without electricity in India and what their um, or secretary of energy, if you will, is really struggling with is how, you know, how do we do that without you know, diving down for more coal and not breaking the bank on uh, some of the still you know, relatively expensive uh, solar technologies coming online, but that, anyway, that's the, uh, the the pace of demand. Okay, so lighting. Then what's mentioned is uh, sort of radios and computers. So here's Marconi, born in Italy, 1874, uh, the son of an Italian country gentleman and an Irish mother. He began experimenting with radio in his, in his father's estate in 1895, so, you know, at the age of 20 or so. Before taking his equipment to the UK, he opened the first transatlantic commercial radio service. So, last week we talked about the first wires running under the Atlantic Ocean, and here we're like, okay, we'll just skip, skip the wires, just send the signal electromagnetically with the radio, and then... Ultimately, he developed the, uh, the ultra-high frequency radio. The other thing that, that is just remarkable to me about uh, radio signals, and I just want to pop back out to the um, electromagnetic spectrum. Let's just take a look. I was going grab to grab an image here. So what we're really looking at here are the, are the radio, um, the radio frequencies. So they're much longer wavelengths. So the wavelengths themselves can be meters to hundreds of meters long, uh, all the way down. Oh, here's here's visible light. Here's X-rays, gamma rays. 
what's always baffling and interesting to me is that these signals, I mean, obviously there's some, uh, there's some interference, but that these signals can sort of exist everywhere and not interfere with each other. You know, if, if these, if, if, the, if the waves were you know, not electromagnetic waves, but, you know, cars driving around, they would bump into each other, even if they were going at different speeds. In fact, especially if they were moving at different speeds. But the speed of light is pretty cool, pretty wild, and that you can have, uh, you know, one long radio wave. And of course, this is not exactly what uh, a wave looks like. I mean, the, the photon itself is doing some kind of fancy spinning, et cetera, et cetera, wave particle duality thing. But um, for, the, for the sake of argument that we sort of just draw it as a sinusoidal wave, um, but you could have this, and then a second, uh, you know, a second frequency sort of sitting there in the same, uh, same chunk of space. And, the, and the, the magic of it is because the photons themselves I just got to go take a quick peek at photons. Um, Again, we, we did a little bit of quantum mechanics early. It's a quantum of light. It's one single particle of light. But what is also pretty amazing is that um, it has zero wet rest mass. You can put as many photons in the same amount of space as you want and not violate any laws of physics. That's what's, I don't know, amazing to me. Another thing that's even more amazing and still on topic here is that neutrinos, which are also released in atomic collu uh, collisions inside the sun, do have mass. And there are tens of millions of them passing through very small regions of our bodies right now, all the time. That they have mass, but we can't feel them, they don't interact, um, but they're, they are also emitted at the same time that a, new, that a photon is in a fusion reaction in the sun. I'm just going to look up the neutrino really quick, too. No electric charge, all about neutrinos. Let's take a look. Um, the Nobel Prize was just recently awarded for some physicists that, that discovered or determined that neutrinos do, in fact, have uh, of mass. So there you go. A neutrino hit a proton and a hydrogen atom. Collision occurred and attracts M and A. So there's just you know just enough interaction with matter to uh, let us know that they're they're there. Just incredibly small, um, and they they do appear to travel at approximately the speed of light as well. So here we go. Nuclear reactions in the sun. Majority of neutrons in the vicinity of the Earth coming in. In fact, there we go. 65 billion solar neutrinos per second in every square centimeter. So that, that, that's like your thumbnail. These, these things are coming out. Okay. So long, you know, long story short, you know, Marconi is sitting there, you know, firing photons at, the, at a very long frequency back and forth. He's got a transmitter. He's got a receiver, and now we've used you know, the electricity flowing in these wires and then uh, through the appropriate resistors, capacitors, inductors to make the appropriate waves that then emanate through space and then are picked up. And what's never ceases to amaze me is we can just sort of keep packing more and more of these into space. And, they, and, it, and space never really gets full. I mean, obviously you can't, um, I mean, it's full to an extent where, like, the police need one, and the and the airlines need another one, and the the local uh, your cell phone provider needs another one. So in that sense, it can be full um, because you want privacy on the channels. But there's really no um, fundamental limit to it. I guess is what's, is what's impressive to me. Okay. So here's a here's a computer, an early IBM PC computer. 
we're, we're running at 4.7 megahertz, so over a thousand times slower where we currently are. 256 kilobytes of memory, so gosh, um, millions of times less memory than we currently have. One floppy disk, no hard disk, and we're selling for 4,000 bucks. <laughs> Man, what in a in a tiny little screen? Yeah. There's no mouse, you know. <laughs> <There's> no <laughs> it's all all line driven code. But you know, you can imagine typing something in and, and putting a Excel spreadsheet together where you got a little input. It tri trickles through your formula and you get get some output. So you can make your financial decisions and whatnot. Um, and another thing that I I like to think of when I'm doing this kind of problem is looking at uh, flows of energy. I, I think there's a, an exam problem like this, but if you look at um, coal, which is you know, obviously primary energy, that's going to go to um, heat in a coal-fired power plant, for example. That heat is then going to make um, steam it's going to convert water from water into steam from liquid phase into gaseous phase. The steam is then going to become kinetic energy to uh, spin a turbine inside the plant. This kinetic energy is then going to become magnetic energy because the, the turbine itself has little magnets sitting around it uh, running at 60 hertz. This is then this is then sent out um, electrically that electric energy in the, in the case of the computer that we're looking at here you know obviously there's some light coming out of there you've got um, some mechanical spinning the disks um, I don't think this computer had speakers but if you've got speakers on it obviously it's becoming acoustic um, but really what, what it comes down to, and this is the kind of the neat thing, it actually turns more or less into information on your computer. So you've gone from coal, which is ancient stored biomass from the sun, heat, steam, kinetic, magnetic, electric, information. And obviously information itself is not energy, but with, and maybe I'm making too much of a leap here, but with the information we're learning, about energy technologies, we can then um, come back and sort of question this the whole system. That's kind of what I like about it. <laughs> uh, anyway. Okay. So there's you know coal to information. Now here's uh, cooking and heating. So rather than you know he heating directly in your house with with coal or wood or paraffin, etc. Uh, you plug in your electric kettle, so in, in the back here, this is just the electric kettle. You've got a big resistor inside, and now you've got your warm water for tea. Um, and since this is UK-based, it says by 1939, about two-thirds of UK homes had an electric supply. It said almost all would have had lighting. 77% would have had an iron, you know, for, for ironing clothes. 40% uh, a vacuum cleaner. 27% uh, would have uh, electric fires, as they were called. So just, you know, a, a big toaster that you stand in front of to stay warm. 16% <laughs> uh, electric kettle, 14% a cooker, and then some kind of electric water heater. So for keeping the bathing water and wash water. It says town gas still remained the fuel of choice for cooking, while coal was prefer, uh, preferred for heating. Uh, my, my parents live in a house in Indiana where all of their energy is electric. Uh, they didn't have the option to get gas, and they didn't want to bring in the propane. Um, they're also fortunate they've got a little bit of um, uh, a heat pump out in their ponds. So they can reduce their both their heating and electric bill by just some um, water heat transfer. Okay, so there's heating. The next one that's mentioned is refrigeration. Now, 
One thing I would love to build in next year's practicum is a, is a bicycle-powered fridge. Um, I, 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 I just think, like, in Montana, you can get away with it better than you might in other states where it's, like, naturally colder here and the, and the um, cooling demands are not as great. Or I could imagine having your, your fridge kind of below ground in a, in a root cellar where it's cold already, you know, not up in your, your hot house. So keep the fridge down there and kill two birds with one stone. You need a sandwich? Run down the stairs and go down to the fridge. But meanwhile, um, I'm going to be up here. I think, I, in fact, yeah, I, I, I drew a figure of this. But, but really, all we're going to do, in fact, I'm going to see if I can do it on this, on this guy. All I want to do, and it's, it's pretty simple. Insert picture, let's see if I can grab it. Documents, courses, this is figure 930, 101. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh. Now let me see if I can do this. File, yeah, I, can't, I can't get into it. Anyway. Um, Really all you would do, I mean, this, this electrical cord right here is just spinning a motor that's running the compressor. And the fridge itself is probably going to be running, let's go back to our human-powered calculation and see, could a person run a refrigerator? So typically a fridge, so P fridge equals 110 volts. And you know, maybe 10 amps. So, mm, gosh, it's a little high. 1100 watts. Okay. So that's that's a pretty big demand. Maybe maybe if you had a 7 amp fridge, uh, you could get away with a little bit less. Maybe if you didn't have a freezer on there, you could get, get away with a little le bit less. But a, one one uh, human power. And this is sort of, you know, exercising vigorously is going to be between 150 to, yeah, let's just say 300 watts, if, if you're kind of going for it. Um, but the fridge itself has a um, duty cycle of around 10%. So your, your fridge is not running 24-7 unless something's wrong with it. Um, so you can imagine if you had a person trying to run the fridge, you would need a duty cycle of somewhere closer to uh, 30 to 80 percent. So if you were going to take your house off the grid, you would kind of need um, kind of a full-time person to keep your food cold for you. <laughs> but if you did a few things, like I said, and, and put the fridge in a place where it's already cold, the duty cycle would, would uh, obviously go down. But that's really all that's going on. All of the, um, all of the heat transfer is, is happening as the, uh, as the refrigerant flows uh, through the condenser, then through the throttle, through the evaporator, uh, back down to the compressors. All the heat transfer is happening. Uh, and of course, what you're trying to do is overcome the heat that is leaking into this box and, and basically pumping it out. This, this Q2 is the, is the heat leaving uh, the, the fridge. So anyway, good little thought experiment. I, I would love to see a um, little bicycle attached to this thing. And you're just earning your dinner by, by pedaling your fridge. What's next? Well, of course, every technology has its downside. And since we were just talking about refrigerant, um, these, these chemicals known as chlorofluorocarbons, um, they're hydrocarbons that have all their hydrogen atoms substituted by a combination of chlorine and fluorine. Uh, kind of nice because they're non non-flammable, they're not going to catch fire, and they're chemically inert. Uh, developed in the 30s by Thomas Midgley, had the dubious honor of inventing 
lead acid, lead additives from petrol, quite, quite the guy. Um, he concentrated on uh, CCL2F2, so that's more or less a, um, that's more or less, and we, we did a lot of, um, it's kind of funny how all these things kind of come together, but what he's looking at is one carbon, uh, two chlorines, and two fluorines. So instead of hydrogen, so this, this looks a lot like a methane molecule, except you've got fluorine and chlorine kicking around instead. Kind of neat because it's um, CFC12 or close to freon. So if we go, let's go back to our periodic table. Dynamic periodic table. If we go here, freon, well, sort of like neon, you know, it, it's carbon with, with four atoms. So this, this atom that we're, or this molecule that we're looking at here is, is um, similar at least in, in, in principle to the, to the neon, except you've got a, a fluorine stick stuck on there, or a couple fluorines and a couple chlorines. So this handy molecule has a, um, it has a boiling point of about negative 30 C. So it's, it's going to be in gaseous form. If you compress it, then it goes to liquid and becomes a, a great heat transfer um, fluid. But the problem, as we can see, with these chlorofluorocarbons is that they tend to react chemically in the atmosphere and have opened up a big hole in the ozone layer. The ozone layer, of course, is a blanket in the atmosphere that keeps us from getting fried by high energy particles from the sun. So also somewhat remarkably, we were able to reduce the sales of uh, CFCs over, gosh, just a number of a couple decades. And this had to be, this had to be passed by law. And this is you know, congressional law. These, these, you could no longer use these because the nice, convenient Coldness was causing problems with people being cooked <laughs> from the sun. Okay, um, a couple other things about electric motors, three-phase electric motors. We talked about three-phase last time. While they are efficient, um, also where is electricity used in the UK today? By 1920, 70 percent of electricity was used in industry and 10 percent for traction. Table 9.3 uh, looks at it in 2009 and tells us that uh, energy industry only uses 7.8 percent. We've got losses of 7.1 percent, and that's just from uh, the fact that the wires we use are not perfect. They get a little bit hot, and, and well, 7 percent loss over transmission. Domestic, 32 percent. Industry, 25.9. Commercial and public administration, so this is just keeping the, the banks and the politicians running at 26.3. Transportation, and then agriculture. Um, agriculture is pretty uh, relatively low. I guess that's just um, a little, little bit of heat and lighting for agriculture. All right, let's take a break and see if we can't uh, get, get through the majority of the rest of the chapter here. Not a whole lot of time, but I think we can do it.